Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much. We have a great conversation today, but first I want to point out that my guests are so knowledgeable and so giving in sharing that today's guest, Nicole Will, is back again to talk about the topic we had originally planned. I got confused and went off on a caring for the caregiver topic, and she rolled with it so well that I didn't even realize we (laughs) technically recorded the wrong topic until we were all done. So she's back to give us even more advice on the dynamic between families and senior living communities and their employees. So welcome back, Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, It's always fun to visit with you. Thanks for joining me again, listeners. I know you're going to totally enjoy today's episode. With me is Lizette Kluta, I got that part right. She She is. She has a website called Think Different Dementia and a podcast that is Dementia Caregiving for Families. Oh my God. Mark this one down. I got them all correct. (laughs) (laughs) On a Monday that started out with no electricity. So Lizette just got back from a cruise for specifically for caregivers and their dementia loved ones. And that's not the best terminology, but you guys get it. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is vacations and memories and why we need to take them and make them while we can. So thanks for joining me, Lizette. Thank you very, very much for having me. And yes, both our days started off not as anticipated. Um, I literally got home at 1 a.m. We're recording this on a Monday without my luggage, without my makeup. Um, (laughs) And poor Jennifer woke up without power. So between the two of us, we're doing pretty well for a Monday morning. Yep, but I'm in California. That is, I've learned that people on the East Coast don't understand the term atmospheric river. But if you just think about the two words, so atmospheric, so in the atmosphere and river, So essentially, a river is pouring down on us, and those of us who, like myself, are solar charged, we're suffering. (laughs) So I need a vacation, so I'm going to have to live vicariously through what you just had, which you said was humbling. Yes. Um, But so let's start off with what's the name of the company that you went with? Because I know I've talked to them in the past. Mm Mm-hmm. And I can, it's um, Elite Cruises and Vacations? That is oh correct. It God. is owned by a uh, registered nurse by the name of Catherine Schof. And it was humbling, gratifying, uh, terrifying, uh, wonderful, all, you know, wrapped up into a tight little ball. Uh, and I cannot wait to go back again it was it was truly one of the best experiences but at the same time one of the worst experiences i've ever had in my entire life <laughs> okay okay well you did you went as a speaker so you did not travel with somebody living with dementia no i did not but i was a speaker as well as a helper which meant that we were pretty much on duty 24 hours a day taking care of these. um, There were nine family members, nine people living with dementia and their families and eight staff members that came with to help and to assist uh, these people living with dementia and their families so that they could do two things. Number one, make memories. And number two, for the family caregivers, have some respite and some support for themselves. That sounds like a pretty good um, pairing. That's not the right word I'm thinking, but the the percentages of staff to vacationers sounds good. Yes, it was about um, like from the for the people living with dementia, we were almost one on one or we could be almost one on one Uh, when we were. When we were divided into the the caregiver respite and the um, 
the times that we were supporting them, you know, we were we were less than one on one because some of the 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 supported crews um, staff support members were working with the with the primary care partner, um, and not everybody utilized the respite times. So I would say we would have about six people that we were supporting that I was helping um, keep them occupied and engaged while their family members were either on respite by going and having a massage or having their fingernails done or having their hair done or whatever they wanted to do on the sea days while we were at sea. Um, or going to the caregiver respite times where there are uh, prior people who have walked their walk who are actually doing some support with them. So it was very comprehensive. It was very, it's very well planned and very well put together. So where where were you guys cruising to, from and to and back? Um. This particular cruise left from Fort Lauderdale, and we went all the way to um, we went to Aruba, then we went to Carousel, and then we went to Bonaire, and then um, stopped at Half Moon Cay in the Bahamas, and then came back. So it was a nine day cruise, of which the first three days we were at sea. So a lot of the educational components occurred during those three days. Um, we did um, different speakers. I spoke on activity engagement. Um, we had another speaker speak on caregiving uh, tips and strategies. And then in the afternoon, we had the respite circles uh, where we where we divided up between um, supporting the people living with dementia and their care partners. That sounds fantastic. And I'm assuming the weather was a whole lot better than California is right oh, now. Oh, <laughs> it was glorious. I have never, ever seen such beautiful, beautiful blue skies and oceans. Uh, we were in entirely blessed. I have never been on a cruise before. So for me, it was a, a massive learning experience in just there's, you know, just things you don't know what you don't know. You know, I mm -hmm. tell my my family caregivers that all the time. If you don't know what you don't know, and I, because I've never been on a cruise, I didn't realize quite how special a cruise this was, in related to what they call the ABCs, um, the Aruba and Bonaire and um, Carousel are not apparently all always on a particular cruise. So this was a highly sought after cruise, and I had no idea. I just showed up. <laughs> Well, that's good. The only cruise I've been on to is one of those booze cruises to Ensenada, Mexico. It's like three days and I don't drink. So I was with a bunch of people who do. And I was like, okay. Um, yeah, that's then, not fun if you don't drink and everybody's drinking around you. Yeah, no. And then we've had COVID and all the horror stories. And so it's like, uh, I like our trailer. <laughs> 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 but there's not support for if you've got your loved one with you that's living with dementia. So you said the first three days um, while you were at sea, going from Florida to the Caribbean, if, mm -hmm. if I got my, my yep, geography got right. <laughs> and I, my husband's from New York. They studied geography. I have explained to him that I am from California. We did not need to study geography because California is the center of the universe and the sun revolves <laughs> around us. Okay. That's why I don't know squat. <laughs> yes, we were in the Caribbean. We were about 19 miles from Venezuela. Nice. Yeah. So the first three days, are you said there was a lot of educational stuff. So why don't you right. talk about um, what you guys were sharing and why that's an important part of these cruises, why somebody should, you know, you kind of think I'm on vacation. I really don't want to learn about caregiving. I want to get away from it. But why? why should we not feel that way? Well, related to the education, every cruise is a little bit different. Um, Kathy brings different presenters in. She puts together b different packages of education for people living with dementia. Um, it is very important for the one of the biggest challenges caregivers have frequently is that they don't have the education they truly need in order to actually do this journey and or do this journey well. 
frequently people tell you, but I don't know what to do to keep my loved one busy or occupied or engaged in activities. So that was the series of three that I did. Um, the first, the first um, presentation I did, we kind of we talked a little bit about staging of dementia and, and trying to truly explain to the family caregivers who a lot of times have heard the word staging of dementia but didn't really know what it meant for them and with their specific loved ones. So it was able to make it a little bit more practical for them. And then they could ask questions because now we know the people that we are supporting and the the people that are with us. So it's easier for us as a group um, of professionals than to help the family members see, oh, this is this is where you are right now in your journey and what that practically means. And the second- so that staging of dementia is actually You'd be surprised. Not a phrase I'm super familiar with. So why mm -hmm. don't you explain that one? I'm sure I'm familiar with it, but not worded that way. Sure. But for those people who are also probably not super clear on the on the to topic. Right. So the medical model uses, uses the words staging of dementia just to make it easier to describe to one another what we're looking at, what we see. There are lots of different staging tools in order to, um, it's just kind of taking the, the the big picture and narrowing it down and saying, oh, this is where the person's functioning. In brief, there are two primary staging tools that I use. The one is called the Functional Assessment Staging Tool, which is a model of retrogenesis, which is just a big fat fancy word for meaning back to the beginning, uh, which describes the journey and the process that a person's brain is going through from where they were normal functioning all the way through to the end of a dementia caregiving process. What I like about it is because it follows a lot of de developmental chronological milestones, it makes it a lot easier to actually explain to family why we or why I would say, you know, your mom's not safe to be home alone. Yes, she's a 90 year old adult, but her brain is processing information like a five year old or like a six year old. So it makes it very concrete for families to then be able to truly understand, oh, I wouldn't leave a five year old home alone. But because my mom is 90 and she's always lived alone, I believe that she still is capable, but she's taking in information the way a five-year-old would. So it makes it very down and dirty and practical. I have to be very careful and very sensitive when I'm talking to people because I understand this is not a five-year-old child. I, I understand that. However, they are processing information the same way. So it, it's a very practical way of being able to express to people where they are, because most people have been around children and developmental milestones and know intuitively that they wouldn't leave said five-year-old alone, but they're doing that with their 90-year-old mother who's thinking in the same way. So it's a, a very handy way of explaining to families exactly what they are looking at. But an easier way of looking at staging is really an, another way, mild, moderate, and severe. And the way I describe that is in mild dementia, this is a person who is still physically and mostly cognitively able to do everything for themselves. They're just starting to make mistakes. They're just starting to be late for appointments or not necessarily understanding some of the, the consequences of their actions. But for the most part, what they the mistakes they're making and so on are not mistakes that are going to have dire consequences. You know, they're 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 maybe making um decisions that they wouldn't have made before, like putting something metal in the microwave or things like that. But, you know, for the most part, they are still pretty safe and they can live alone and they and they have fair quality of doing things. But people are starting to notice it falling apart. 
Then the middle bucket is the bucket where the person physically can do everything for themselves, but they cannot think it through for themselves anymore. And they really only need you to tell them what to do. They need help with sequencing things, you know, putting it in the right order or picking the right clothes for a fancy meal out because, you know, it's raining in California and they may not put the right clothes on to go out in the rain, those kinds of things. So they can do everything physically, but they just need thinking assistance. So sequencing and those kinds of things, quality control. Uh, they won't notice, like, for example, their clothing is dirty, needs to be changed, things like that. So that's the middle bucket. Need somebody to walk alongside, hold their, not literally hold their hand, but verbally problem solve and help them do things. And this person needs a lot of supervision. And then the last bucket is the last stage where the person needs both physical assistance and thinking assistance. So those are three those are three buckets that make it also very easy to explain to people where somebody is functioning. And when you understand the stages of dementia, it really can make it easier for you as a family caregiver to understand how much support you need to provide the person that you're helping. Well, I love that. So I'm familiar with all of that. You just worded it different. But that was probably one of the best explanations I've ever heard. I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I especially liked the retrogenesis uh -huh. where you're talking about basically they're reversing through abilities because you always hear, you know, you can't treat them like children, you know, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, but they're acting like a four-year-old or, you know, whatever. And so the way you put it was just beautiful. So that was, that was one of your talks or. Yes, that was one of the talks. It was about a 45 minute talk. The, the middle talk was a little bit more um, practical on just explaining, um, you know, how to engage people in activities, what kind of things that we can look at, how to physically structure things, how much help to give cognitively to them. It was the, the one that was the 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 hardest and probably not the best received. The first one was really well received. The middle one, everybody was super tired. And the last <laughs> one, everybody was really, really engaged because in the last presentation, we really went into a lot more how to actually um, cue, you know, how to provide the verbal support or the physical support or when to start adding those kinds of supports to the family you know for the for the family caregiver in order to make it easier and so that one was really very well received so it they were three unique um presentations each in their own can stand alone but but the first and the last were definitely the ones that were the most well received yeah i probably would have benefited from learning how to cue my mother better because i took over her care when she was in the the later stages she was still physically mobile could walked and everything with no aids um talked fairly understandably although as the i took care of her for three years so as it as it progressed everything sounded like a normal sentence like you just mm -hmm. walked into the middle of a conversation and you're like i gotta catch up although that was never an option. <laughs> um so she never got to that mumbling stage there was a gal mm -hmm. in the memory care that um, walked around and mumbled to herself and she'd come up to you and and try to engage with you in a conversation and it was it was all mumble or occasionally celtic irish mm -hmm. which was not something i speak so <laughs> it was always it was always a challenge but my mom the more help she needed the less she accepted and so i think cueing would have been definitely beneficial for everybody in my mom's orbit because we all needed better help with that one so that was what you guys were doing on the first three days. Besides the learning, what are you doing while you guys are at sea? Because um, I could t I could just hear now people are like, why would I want to spend the money on a cruise to take my mm -hmm. loved one with me and then sit there and listen to these things? I could do that wherever else, podcast, well, YouTube. <laughs> sure. The, um, to, to be very clear, uh, it's only about two hours in the morning that the education is on the on the sea days and then in the afternoon it's about two hours 
two to two and a half hours in the afternoon when we're doing the respite. Um, but there is a very much a lot of eating. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite hobbies. <laughs> probably some of the best food I've ever had in my life. Um, and a lot of fellowship. So, uh, we, you know, we spent a lot of time together. Families can have, there, there are two ways people tend to do this. Some of the families stayed fairly well with the group, um, always ate together as a group. Some of the families were a little more comfortable and confident in their own abilities and so they spent a little more time alone. They didn't come to all of the the, the meals together. Uh, but there is a, a wide variety of um, opportunities for people. And then in the afternoon after the respite, you know, families could go on activities. There are a lot of activities on the boat, on the ship. I keep being told it's a ship, not a boat. Uh, but I keep calling it a boat um, on the ship for people to do a variety of different things. There are arts and craft activities, there's spas, there, you know, the swimming pool, um, there was a casino, uh, there was music, just all sorts of other activities. And then in the evening after dinner, uh, some people would retire to their room because their loved one needed more rest. Um, but some of them would go out and dance and go sing and do those kinds of things in the evening. Um, the group is very diverse or each group is very different. So, it, you know, it really is going to depend on the needs of the family that are coming on, on the tour. We had one family that was a mom and a dad and their adult daughter. So mom would come to certain things. The daughter would go to other things. They just decided for themselves which uh, which what they needed. Um, so it's really it's very specific to what your own particular needs and desires are. There were some families that needed more respite and not as much family caregiving um, education where they would just leave their loved one and go to the pool, go to the spa, do do their own self-care while we were engaging with their family members. And then there were other families that truly needed that support from the caregiver circle, providing them um, strategies to try to help with their emotional resilience for this journey. Did the people living with dementia, did they some of them get together in kind of like little friend groups? It was absolutely wonderful to see. Uh, you know, each group, group is going to be different. There was an older woman who was there with her husband, um, early, late six, 60s, early 70s. And she is very aware that she has dementia and would actually express that to us. Um, there was a gentleman who took it upon himself uh, very significantly cognitively impaired already, but would um, put his arm around another gentleman who was younger than him who also had dementia and seemed to, to truly connect with him on an emotional level. Even though they couldn't really communicate, they were communicating. <laughs> My mom had friends in memory care, mm -hmm. which was probably the best part of her memory care stay. Um, her living with me would have been terrible for everybody, her, me. And I've talked about that before on other episodes, but the, the mischief and mayhem she got involved with with these <laughs> other ladies. And so most of my listeners know my mom's name was Diane. She befriended Diane Stewart and they befriended Diane Rabinsky. And so I referred to them as Diane, other Diane and other, other Diane, because it was freaking <laughs> confusing as it was without a cognitive impairment. And it just, you know, like my mom liked to sit around and shoot the breeze. Mm -hmm. and that's what she wanted to do. And when you're cognitively, you know, functioning normal, whatever normal is for you, and you like for me, I had a business to run and a household to maintain and blah, 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 things I wanted to do. It was very hard to just sit there and shoot the breeze because like I couldn't 
being in that reality was really difficult mm -hmm. because it was hard to shut off my brain going, okay, now we could be doing and, and running through the to-do list or the, the want to-do list. It was just, oh, it was so hard. And I would show up for visits and the three of them would be sitting out in the beautiful courtyard just blah, 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 blah. And it was, it was wonderful. I'm going to yeah. start writing down some of the stories because I think people have a very negative view of you know, memory care residences. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie, the day we moved my mom's stuff in, there was a gentleman there in his flannel pajamas with a teddy bear stuffed down the back of his pants. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. And it all worked out fine. <laughs> but, right. you know, it's it's hard. And you you don't think about the support they give each other. Yes. Because it, it's somebody that's like you that's part of your team or your tribe it's like person that's like you it's not going to criticize you so that's why i asked that yeah. question because no I, I, can... I think you bring a very valid point you know i'm i want people with dementia to stay at home if it's the right thing for them but it isn't always the right thing for them and it isn't always the right thing for the family caregiver um but there is a lot to be said about the socialization that the people received, that everybody received on this cruise. Uh, the you know we when we had the the respite times where we were engaging with the people with dementia and um, working with them so that the family could go take a break. Uh, the the socialization that they were able to have was very very good to see, and then. The other part of this cruise that really was remarkable, and it was it's ironic because last night, as on my way back home from the um from the cruise, I ended up at at the airport uh, waiting on my flight. My flight was really, really late in the evening. But I was sitting, I went and got myself a glass of wine because I'm like, now I'm done. Um, <laughs> I'm tired and I'm done. Um, and so I went to, I went to the, the bar on the on the airport and I had a glass of wine and there was a couple sitting right next to me and I recognized the gentleman and we just struck up a conversation and he's he's like, well, we were also on the cruise with you. And um, then they started to talk about what they had observed mm. because on the last day when we were at Half Moon K, they actually were right next to us on the beach where we had these people who have some of them moderately severe physical impairment, some of them um, definitely, you know, significant cognitive impairment. Some of them you couldn't tell as much because physically they're still doing pretty well. But they literally were right next to us on the beach, and they said it was one of the best things to watch us help these people who are having challenges using um, beach wheelchairs to get them in the water, to get photos with them and their family, and um, just the care and the dedication that Kathy and her team did to keep everybody safe, which you don't think about, you know, um, a beach can be pretty hazardous, yeah. uh, you know, and uneven surfaces and sand and, and, and those kinds of things. But what struck me from the conversation I had with them was that they noticed, without me even saying anything, that they noticed that this was a group that was supporting another group. That's a good... That's that says shows you guys did a really good job that they noticed and were impressed. Yeah. They were so they what, were very impressed. That's awesome. That's kudos for Kathy and the rest of you that were doing this. She does this all the time. So yes, she <laughs> I don't does know how this she like, survives. She is a phenomenal woman. She has a lot of um passion to help people. She has a core group of um staff that travel with her. Um, alternating people, depending on schedules. Uh, she always makes sure that everybody is staffed appropriately uh, to ensure that the that the people have the right level of support for them. I'm assuming she's aware before everybody gets on board at what stage the people living with dementia are at so that you can staff appropriately? 
it it is a little challenging to sometimes get accurate information related to that because oftentimes families do not necessarily recognize the challenges that their person actually exhibits. Uh, so, for example, one of the questions she always asks is, has your loved one ever walked away from home, right, to ensure that we have the right strategies in place for somebody who might wander? Well, the 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 opportunity there is sometimes people haven't wandered at home, but then you get into an unfamiliar surrounding and then they wander there. Uh, so, yes, all attempts are made to ensure that the the person um, that we know what the person's abilities are before they get there. The reality of the matter is the night before when everybody gets together, that's the first time we get eyes on and be able to say, OK, this is what we're you know, this is where the person is. This is what we need to be aware of. But things change, you know, dementia changes on a daily basis. So yep. it's also not always reliable to see what somebody looks like when they just got off of a plane yeah. after <laughs> having traveled. And then they're different the next day when they wake up again. Um, and then people definitely were different depending on on their own fatigue levels after a busy day out, you know, onto the island of Aruba and doing things. So it was very that was what was so humbling for me is to see it's one thing to know and go and see people for our blocks as a therapist or even go visit my mom and dad and spend several hours with them uh, but to to have spent this extended period of time with these families and then to truly see the vast differences from day to day and moment to moment um, really was experientially for me the best education I could have received I can see that yeah it's a whole lot different when you get a 24-hour look at somebody versus an mm -hmm. hour look it's a very that's a whole lot of different it's data, very data very points. different very different and and the you know the reality of the matter I love therapists dearly I am when I'm an occupational therapist but we can be pretty nearsighted, I think, sometimes in in just focusing on the what we deem to be the skilled thing that we're trying to fix, right? the the balance or the whatever. And I think therapists need to be taught more, and it's one of the things i'm I'm striving to do to take a a, a bigger um, bird's eye view of the situation because i don't think therapists necessarily and they're not doing it on purpose i know they're not doing it on purpose but they're not factoring into their um equation of you know home exercise program or education the the fabric of the household and the reality that you know Mom may have three doctor's appointments, dad may have another two, and I may have one all in one week. And you're trying to, you know, get me to do X, Y, Z as therapy, you know, with the person. So it, it was very educational to see how we as, as a medical model, as a healthcare pro um, provider, <coughs> excuse me, can actually um, change what we're doing to actually facilitate increased carryover by changing a little bit how we actually interact with the family and looking at the big picture. That makes perfectly good sense. And we need to send all of you guys on cruises like this. <laughs> I'm sure they would all love to. I'm, well, I would hope so. So we've talked about all of the benefits of going except for creating memories with your loved one and that actually gets a lot harder i'm not sure mm -hmm. people are really aware of that um i my mom's been gone for about four years and a lot of the memories are challenging ones they're not you know it's like yeah we had a nice time at the park but getting her from you know from the building to the car from the car to a bench in the park you know it's just like you know there it's not 
it's not it's seamless. hard to not yeah you almost have to like chop out the challenging part so you can remember the good stuff but yes um why should somebody consider spending the money for a, cr a cruise like this besides okay we know we're getting respite we know we're getting education but that last component of of building memories i think is as important maybe one of the oh, most important i think it's the mo one of the most important parts of this whole cruise it's because the 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 way a cruise is set up where you take a lot of the stress off of the family to actually go make the meals go shopping do the laundry make the bed just all the stuff that you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis You've created energy um, and act by having all of those things taken care of. For example, I never once made up my bed. You know, I picked up a phone and I said, you know, steward, would you please bring me clean towels? Uh, would, you, would you come fix the room? So a lot of those things are built into the cruise, which means you get up in the morning you can have room service delivered to your room, have a cup of coffee with your loved one, not be rushing to try to get your breakfast done and all of those kinds of things. Get them ready for the day. Go downstairs, sit down at a full course meal, uh, breakfast, interacting with other adults uh, who are all experiencing what you're experiencing. So they have a commonality with you. You don't have to explain to anybody why. Susie's off the chain this morning because everybody <laughs> gets it. Everybody understands um, that pressure is taken off of you. So throughout the whole entire experience, everybody's taking photos. We're all taking photos of one another with one another, um, different snapshot, literally snapshots of people's day where 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 we can catch the person with dementia with this huge big fat grin on their face that you might not have caught because you're busy doing something else. So taking the you know the 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 stress of you off of you related to just everyday kinds of activities really frees you up to then create these moments of joy. But consistently throughout this cruise, we are all reminding the people on the cruise, make the memories, make the memories. You know, go to, go swim, go sit and drink a, a, a milkshake up on the, the, the top deck, go sit in the sun, uh, take them for a walk, look at, you know, around. I mean, it's just beautiful. Um, and then just watching the the families who who were there all had these huge smiles on their faces as they saw the person that they're supporting enjoy themselves. So it was making a lot of wonderful memories. And then you know we take we take them out on on excursions. Uh, the families have choices related to whether they you know the the cruise line has lots of different types of excursions. But then we also did excursions with some of the people. Um, so there's a variety of you can you can create your own memory by choosing your excursion or go on an excursion with us and and get to hear all of our bantering and uh, laughing and helping and supporting. That just sounds amazing. And I never would have thought and this just shows you how all these everyday things that we have to handle breakfast, meals, walking the dog, etc. how that's just, it's it's kind of pressure. It's not necessarily bad pressure, but it's just things we got to do. It's responsibility. That's the, that's the right word. And you remove all that, it makes making the memory so much easier. Yeah. Like if somebody had transported my mom to the park, she and I would go watch kids. That was yes. the one activity that I could do with her that made her happy. Everything else I tried complete failure and it was probably because one i was trying too hard and two it was there was all of this responsibility to make sure she got in the in and out of the mm -hmm. car safely and she was like i said she walked just fine without any aids but god forbid there was a change in 
the surface we were walking on. So if you went from mm -hmm. the sidewalk to the grass, you would get the arms spinning. And the, I mean, you would have thought this woman was about to just collapse over in a heap. Mm -hmm. And it was just because her brain could not process like what's like, why, is, why does it feel different now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there was this constant concern about getting her from point A to point B. And I never really realized that that was why making the memories was such a challenge mm -hmm. just because of that, that intense responsibility that I felt right. for her. And then the so other where, thing, you know, when mm -hmm. the staff were there, the staff was always aware of what's needing to be done. So for example, in the dining room, you know, this is a cruise. There are thousands of people on this ship, not the boat. Um, and, Johnny needs to go to the bathroom while well, we send Eric, the staff member, so that Susie doesn't need to get up from dinner to take her husband to the bathroom. So it brings the level of stress down. We cannot take it all away because we're not with them overnight. But a, lar a large extent is the, the burden is carried by multiple people for the period of the cruise, allowing you to actually enjoy yourself with the person that you love. Do you think that after being on this cruise, more caregivers are fully understanding why they need a team of support? Because now they've had it, now they're going home and they may not have it, likely they don't. You they think likely, that they've- Yeah, they likely don't have the support. I think, I think that's a really good question. Um, I would divide the group into three. About a third of the group are not going to change anything because they're not ready to change. Even though they have seen and experienced the support and the opportunities that they had, they are still so focused on their own um, frustrations or challenges or inability to actually um, change their own mindset about the experience that they're in. They are still not ready to change. They're not ready to be a caregiver. So about a third of them uh, kind of fell in that group. About a third of them are doing everything they can to put support systems around them. Um, and then the middle third is that halfway in between where they're starting now to realize they need to do something, um, but are just exploring what that looks like. Which makes sense because everybody's at a different stage of yeah. their caregiving journey. I just, after hearing this whole conversation, I'm thinking if somebody doesn't go home and understands the, the need, you know, the absolute importance of having a team, well, they may never understand it, unfortunately. No, they may and never understand it. And that is unfortunate. And, you know, part of what we want to do is help facilitate people's growth as a caregiver, as a care provider um, to somebody who they, they are helping. But the reality of the matter remains, it is up to you as the care partner of a person to change. It's not the person living with dementia is not going to change. Um, and whether you whether you want to be a caregiver or not, you're now a caregiver. And if you stay in the I don't want to be a caregiver mode, it's never likely going to change. And it's probably going to suck. Yep. <laughs> right. But if yep. you if you really start to think to yourself, OK, I, I didn't I didn't. You know, nobody signs up for this. Nobody wants to do this. It's not like I want to have a baby. I want to be pregnant and have a baby. Nobody wants an an adverse, challenging thing in their life, whether it's cancer or COPD or lung cancer or a head injury or whatever. Nobody wants these things. Nobody wants to get divorced. Nobody wants somebody they love to pass away. Nobody wants those things. Nobody wants to necessarily be a caregiver, right? But we can control how we respond to the situation. That's what we can control. We cannot control the situation, but we can control how we respond to it. And so that's what I want family caregivers to realize that when you 
when you choose to respond in a different way to the circumstance, you can make it easier. It doesn't take it all away, but it definitely makes a massive big difference because when you're when you're in that camp of I'm not going to change how I respond, well the situation is still going to dictate what happens. You you're, know, you're not changing your response might make it worse. Exactly. And kick, and kicking and screaming the entire way is not <clears throat> not going to make it fun. <laughs> no. No, and a lot of people unfortunately, you know, never actually get out of that particular and, and I understand why. I mean, a lot of people, you know, we we have drama. People have drama in their lives. I'm not, uh, you know, people were abused by that, that person that they're caring for, or uh, they were abandoned, or there was alcohol involved, or, you know, whatever, whatever the, you know, dysfunctional families, all of that stuff play a role. I understand that. Um, but the reality is you can still choose how you respond to it. And when you when you empower yourself with that decision, like I grew up in a in a household where, um, you know, my my parents used a lot of alcohol. We were never abused per se, like smacked around or, you know, bloody noses and hit you know faces through the wall type of abuse. But we were probably abandoned to a large extent, at least emotionally, never financially, never in in stuff but it, you know emotionally my sister and I were definitely abandoned when we went to boarding school and I had a choice I mean I had a choice I could make right I could say I was abandoned as a kid um oh woe is me and doom and gloom my mom and dad did this to me um but one day I realized you know I'm okay with who I am and I am who I am because of what I went through so therefore I cannot hate what I went through and I was able to put it behind me, and now I have no animosity towards my parents related to the fact that we were in boarding school. And it doesn't bother me that I have to help them because, you know what, it's the right thing to do. Um, but I understand not everybody can make that shift. But if they cannot make that shift, then they shouldn't assume the responsibility of being the primary caregiver. Then they need to find it. A, a fiduciary or a fiscal, you know, an intermediary or a decision maker who can make those decisions and not be responsible. That's a good point. Getting an intermedi intermediary, yeah. easy for me to say. I, I've had a lot of people on Facebook, you know, reach out and say, well, this and this and this situation happened um, and I'm resentful and angry or whatever. And then I'll say to them, then your responsibility is to find the person to become the guardian ad litem. And then you step away. Then you don't do it. But you don't just drop them. You don't just not do something. You you put in place that one thing that then means that person is cared for, but you walk away. Like I always said with with the staff where my mom lived, I was the captain of her care team. Mm -hmm. And I I because I witnessed families of residents being demanding and you know I, I kept thinking you're gonna go home and leave your loved one with these people and you've just alienated them you just like this is stupid like yes. yeah I'm like now i never saw anything bad and then they, they did not have there was the three years my mom lived there there was a very stable core of caregivers mm -hmm. um one guy who i thought maybe wasn't a good fit for that job did leave so I was like, okay, that's cool. I didn't, I didn't feel badly when, when that turnover happened, but it was like, you know, they would call me and say, like one day, I think they called me. A lot of times they'd wait until mom and I were coming back from whatever we had done to let me know that mom needed these personal care items or, I, but I think the one day when the caregiver that was in charge of my mom called me up and says, your mama need new shoes. And I was like, <laughs> are you kidding me? And that's when I was like, crap. When we bought the new shoes two years ago, probably should have bought multiple pairs because my mom didn't recognize new things as hers. Right. So fortunately, we found a similar pair. I had the clerk at the store, the cashier, cut the tags off. I put. I asked my mom to put the new shoes on, so she walked out of them. The old shoes went in the box. I tossed them in the trunk of my car, and I thought, okay, they're similar enough. She shouldn't, you know, there's not an mm -hmm. option. So I was like, huh. But, you know... It just, 
you're never not part. I mean, you can decide not to be a part of their life, but I always figured I was, I was the captain of the team and it mm -hmm. required a team. So, and it I just wish I had, does. oh yeah. And it, and it made it a lot easier because I felt like I had them to talk to and, you know, they would say things like when my mom started getting a lot more difficult to deal with, they'd be like, your mom was so easy. She was so easygoing. I was like, you didn't know her when you were a teenager. And then they'd <laughs> laugh and I could tell them stories. And, you know, it was it was supportive of me, which mm -hmm. I knew, but I, I knew it more um, after. Right. Like, well, I didn't see my mom the last two weeks of her life because of COVID. And I was like really missing talking to them, not just as a support, but... Just, just somebody that understood my situation. So sure. I can see how these cruises are so beneficial, not just for the education or the respite or the memories, but just all of it and just kind of opening your eyes to new ways of thinking about caregiving. Mm -hmm. It's just, I think somebody, everybody should, you know, this is coming out at the end of March, beginning of April, just a time for people to start planning their big trip for this year. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, all of it's elite cruises and vacations, right? Correct. And I, I, I knew the, the first two words were right. It was the and vacations part that all, her website is going to be linked in the show notes as long as well as mm -hmm. the, in the episode I did with her, like, I don't know, a hundred years, a hundred years ago. Yep. <laughs> you know, way pre COVID <laughs> so that you guys can also listen to Kathy talk and then find a vacation that's right for you and your loved one. Yep. And then if um, people are m interested in finding out a little bit more about me, I do a free monthly workshop every month uh, for family caregivers to learn how to help support their their loved one with dementia. So if they want to sign up for one of my free workshops, I'd welcome to have your guests. Awesome. And that will also be linked in the episode notes. Um, there's a lot of great stuff if you just, you know, scroll down. A lot of hot links, previous episodes that are related, sponsors you guys should check out, and obviously every all the information about the guest and the topic. So we're going to let Lizette go. Maybe her uh, luggage will find its way back home. <laughs> oh, all I can tell you is I did a I did a um another promotional live earlier today, and my makeup was on the baggage that was coming and arrived 10 minutes before I had to go onto the video and I had just enough time to put my face on and not look like death warmed over. <laughs> well, now you probably need those Apple air tags because I always see those little stories where somebody's like, well, I know where my luggage is. You know, and you can see like a little map where the air tag is and, you know, you're in New Jersey and they're in, you know, Texas or wherever. And it's just, it's. I knew exactly where they were. I, my, my one flight landed very close to the other one. I was like the last person back onto the new flight. And um, I had, thankfully, thankfully it was in the same terminal or I would not have made it. Um, and I knew getting on the I knew getting on the airplane, my luggage was not going to make it. I knew it. Um, it was just too close. You know, it was much too close of a of a layover. We were late on the one end. And and I'm like, I was just grateful to get my makeup so that I could put my face on before I showed up on somebody's video. <laughs> oh, modern life is so crazy. Well, I appreciate this. Hopefully your uh, the rest of your luggage will uh, reappear in the next oh, couple here. of hours. I, I oh, it's here. I have everything in the laundry. Life is good. I can I can move on. I have underwear for tomorrow. You know? All the important things. But you don't have a steward to handle those things for you. I know. So bummer. <laughs> which is which is really sad because they were very very good at what they did. Yes, it's like what um, years ago we were between homes because our new we sold our house and the new home that was being built wasn't ready. So we lived with my paternal grandmother for three months and she had a washer and dryer that was like almost as old as me. And I think, <laughs> uh, let's see, this was in 2003. So yeah, I was in my thirties. So yeah, the washer and dryer were really old. They were chocolate brown, if that gives you any clue. And so we just took our clothes to the full service laundromat. So it was a dry cleaner and laundromat, but they also had the wash and fold service. Holy cow, was that a good deal? No kidding. You know, especially if you didn't take too many pairs of jeans, which this was during the summer. So we didn't, because they did it by the pound. So things like 
towels and jeans and other heavy items you might want to do yourself and hang to dry outside. <laughs> but yeah, um, it was really nice. You bring up a really good point um, related to caregivers. If a caregiver can find small ways of decreasing the burden of housekeeping on themselves by doing a wash and fold or getting a housekeeper once a week to clean. Those are, we think about it in terms of, I cannot necessarily afford it, but can you really not afford it? You know, what does it give you back? If exactly. you can, if you can, if you can invest a little bit of money in these activities that can support you longitudinally, you will have the 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 strength to do this for the long haul. Yep, and a, and a housekeeper is a lot cheaper than in home caregivers for sure. Well, this is awesome. It sounds like we could talk for another hour, but yep. I'm going to let you go. I'm and never going to have trouble with something to say. <laughs> <laughs> me, me either. I appreciate this, and we should do this again sometime. Yeah, we should. We definitely awesome. should. Thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.